You know what you should have called this movie? What? Relationship counselling made easy. <laughs> we can still probably add that. <laughs> or perhaps when it goes into the American market. I think, I think market. the film's Maybe. based on the fact that neither of these characters has had any counselling whatsoever. What is this movie about? This is about two people finding their way, two people dealing with the fact that they're over 55 and working out how to be in the world, what's appropriate. They're two people dealing with their internal turmoil and kind of the punches and blows that life sets up. Now, John, you can answer, but you can't say the same thing as Karen. Mm. It's a film about a couple of negative nihilistic people who think the world owes them a living. Um, and the wonderful thing about it is uh, he, I'm tied to a chair for most, or my character's tied to a chair for most of the film. So that becomes a level playing field so that the uh, only difference between men and women really is muscle. Uh, and so it becomes a level playing field and, and it's it's a... Uh, war of attrition about the um, difference between men and women and finally about uh, him and her. It's also about, in one way, misogyny and misanthropy butting heads mm. in the same room. Probably. Well, we know that it's rampant <laughs> out there, you know, how everyone feels about each other at various times. And I think mm. Christiana Marek, our writer, wanted to explore that. She's done a lot of research, mm. forensic research and research into kind of human behaviour in relationships. And, and I think from a woman's point of view, she wanted to really explore that and put, you know, get down to the dirty nitty gritty and put it out there. She wanted to make a film that, that got people talking. The whole setup is based on presumption. Correct. About the presumption Stalker. of what a woman is doing when she flirts. Mm -hmm. And the presumption of what a woman is doing when she dresses a certain way. Why was that of such interest to you? In taking on the role of Emily? I guess because that interests me. Certainly as a mature woman who, you know, in my <clears throat> youth I thought I was pretty cool and, you know, didn't seem to have any trouble getting the boy's attention. Get to a certain age, you absolutely become invisible. And you can't go out there kind of flirting it up um, like you did when you were younger or just being younger and kind of more vibrant. So to be able to explore that in Emily as a mature woman was, I think, important and I think important for all women. And John, what do you think about the fact that the film really exposes those impulses that men have, that women, by behaving in a certain way or dressing in a certain way, are automatically sending out a signal which might not actually be true? Um, well, I don't think it, it's, uh, that this film's really a, about that, really. Uh, I think it's um, more uh, about um, the, the Venus-Mars thing, you know. Um, I, I think the sexuality c comes into it and the, the attraction comes into it. Uh, but my character, Jack, is... Um, He's just pissed off with the notions that women have continuously, and um, you know this in this depth thing and and this tearing everything apart. And he, I think he's just would would like them just to say, look, just keep it simple, stupid. I mean, just you have to delve into every adjective. I mean, every metaphor. I mean, just what what is why is it so goddamn important? You know, just cool off. In the development of this project, <laughs> were you guys deliberately reacting against the current media culture of automatic outrage to anything that could be deemed offensive or inappropriate? I mean, your film seems to just deliberately ignore any notions of what can and can't be said between two people. I think if we're in a privileged position to be able to make a feature film or anything that can get out into the public domain, I think why waste an opportunity? Who wants to see a boring, safe film? Why would you spend your money? I certainly wouldn't. That can be life every day. I'd much rather go to the cinema and hate something and work out in my brain why. But this film, the reaction so far, we were unsure. We wanted to make something that was edgy and interesting and inspirational in some way. Um, the reaction has been so positive and the amount of humour at laughing at the inappropriate that is within this film has been kind of 
brilliantly surprising. We thought so, but, you know, we're a bit warped. So mm. we thought, well, we love it. But we find general consensus is people are really happy to laugh at the dirty, you mm. know, bad stuff. Was that a I good answer? Did you like it? It's a very good answer. And my follow-up answer to that, yeah. given the strong reaction that you've had to the film, is are feminists going to love or hate this film? Who cares? Or do you, <laughs> you, you beat me? <laughs> or do you care? You don't care. Um, well, what you were hinting on before, I come from a generation um, where all of this PC stuff kind of originated, you know. Um, but I, I'm 63, so I, I'm at the top end of the baby boomer range. When I, I hate PC, I can't stand it, and. Um, I go out of my way to be as un PC as I possibly can be at all times. You know, what? Karen. Yes. Your thoughts on PC? I just think we're overgoverned, overruled, too many restrictions. You know, in every way. It's not. I'm not saying. I'm. I care about people. I care about people's feelings. I. I think humans are despicable and brilliant. Um, I think if we can make a film that shakes some things up, so be it. Brilliant, great. And also, how do you how do you grow if you are never challenged? How do you grow as a human being? We can spend our entire lives blaming someone else for our reaction. Well, that's rubbish because another person won't have the reaction. The person who's having the reaction has got to learn to take responsibility for the reaction they're having, and. That's the end of that lesson. And is there a particular conversation that you want people to have after seeing your film? Yeah, I think you can. I think what we should learn or or relearn is that you can be constructively offensive. I don't think you should be brutally and hurtfully offensive. But um, as Karen was saying, it's all too bloody guarded, and, and pe people can't have an honest conversation. And the whole feminism thing has gone. Far too far. And, I mean, if women talking about some guy who had his penis cut off, they all laugh. But if you talk about some bloke cutting a breast off, it's horrendous. Um, both of them are horrendous, but you know, you get my drift. Yes. Um, it, it, we're funny, and what we do that's silly and stupid is funny, but what they do, if we pick it out what women do that's silly and stupid, we're being, um, femi uh, uh, we're being sexist. We don't condone any of the things that go on in the film, of course. I do. I just did. <laughs> <laughs> but we've all had those moments where we thought, man, I just want to smack that person in the head. So in the film we explore that, mm. right? And so, she does. And I do. <laughs> and we wanted to turn the tables. And you translate a lot of that anger literally. Yeah. But I, 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 I admit I've had times where I've absolutely mm. wanted to whack someone in the head. Now, there's... Little Death. Yep. There was a, another Australian film last year called My Mistress. And there was also, of course, Fifty Shades of Grey and your film, all playing with this notion of exploring the darker corners of people's sexuality and psyches. What's going on? What's in the ether? Well, what's interesting, we had an interview yesterday and we listened to M. Night Shyamalan. And he is so articulate and clearly and intelligently... Uh, spoke about where humanity kind of seems to be sitting. He said, you know, if someone tried to make On Golden Pond today, it would never happen. What people want to see are things pushed slightly beyond their comfort zone and a little bit into the, un you know, the nastier side of things. The fact that people love Mick Taylor in Wolf Creek, seriously love him as a, like a, a god. They know that he's wrong, bad, horrid. John will, you know, attest to that how, what a, you know, he doesn't like him, but he's he's a brilliant character. Why? Somehow he's safe he's where funny. he is. And he's funny. And it is about we're at a point somehow where we are wanting to be challenged in the ways we think about things and what's appropriate and what's not. It is an ether thing. I really believe it, that, you know, whatever's happening, there are more films now and certainly TV series that all lean towards the dark side. There ain't no Brady Bunch out there right mm. now. So, you know, it's like Top of the Lake or, you know, The Killing. Jeez, I want your observations and your opinions on the current state of the film industry. What are your general views about how it's going, but how it can be improved, about what it can learn?
We've got strong views, but I'm going to let John speak because mm. I usually blab on about this one. Um, well, I don't think it has changed tremendously. Um, I was very lucky. I, I came out of NIDA in 73 and walked straight into the, um, you know, the renaissance of the Australian film industry. And uh, luckily I held on to my um, Australian accent and hadn't got all theatrical. So I was a walk-up start and I got a lot of, lot of work. Um, but I think it's cyclical. I, I think it's everything that's always happened is still happening. Um, if we knew how to make a, 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 a profitable film, we'd make one every day and I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be sitting overlooking the ocean in Europe somewhere probably in a big mansion. But nobody knows how to make a movie like that. Uh, so sometimes in, a, in a, a year you'll get a one really good Aussie film. Sometimes you'll get three. You'll get Priscilla. You'll get uh, Strictly Ballroom and Muriel's in one year. Um, and this year's looking like it because... Um, this is extraordinary. Yeah, it's yeah. We, we've got the dresser and everyone dress seems maker. to think that's the dressmaker. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Uh, and, and Last Cab to Darwin. And, uh, of course, Stalker is going to be way up there. Holding the man. So, and holding the man. Uh, so A water divider, paper planes. It's, oh, it's going nuts. It's the really, daughter is great. So exciting. So we've got a, we've got a big year. But uh, probably just as many movies were made last year. So uh, And only Wolf Creek 2 did extremely well. And uh, so, But this year, hopefully, that, that will change. So I don't think that changes. What does change is the digital era and you know different ways of making movies and illegal <laughs> downloads, yeah. and um, which really get up my pecker. That that's what is making the film industry much more difficult. Um, so that's why we have got this road tour going on. We go to every regional because you can't illegally download box office. So if you can make some money at the box office and your film is not ridiculously outrageous in the budget department, well, you may have a chance of making some money back, but you're going to be struggling to get it back from the, the soft digital. And we're just, we want to get back out there and reignite people's love and respect of Australian film. Because I know I felt it drop off for a while and it, I think we thought we had to go up against the big Hollywood blockbusters mm. and they've got a massive machine behind them. We don't. We never will. We'll ne we don't make movies like that, I don't think. Occasionally, you know, we might get a Mad Max or something like that that's, you know, got some Hollywood money. But Australian films are beautiful in their simplicity. The, the other problem with... Uh, the Australian film industry is a sporadic way of making a movie. We lurch from one film to the other, and we still get government handouts. Uh, we don't do that. We do the show, but we don't really do the business. That's, we, we need to develop a machine. I mean, the, the the machine of movie making. We've got no trouble with pre-production, post-production, through to post-production, through to delivery. No problem with the best in the world at, at that at times. Um, but marketing and, and, and getting it out there, we're, very, we're piss poor at that. And we need to uh, find a mechanism um, to sell the thing properly. I mean, we've got a great storytelling culture. We have made some exquisite films. If you gathered all the Australian films and put them in one place... It's an overwhelm of greatness. The fact that we undervalue the kind of credibility and the what it gives back to our culture, uh, that makes me incredibly sad. Australia leads the world in illegal downloads. Yes. Good on us. Yes, yes. this is mm. we should have it like maybe on our flag. Okay, well, Wolf Creek 2, uh, last time I looked about four months ago, 2 million downloads. Um, so that's $20 million stolen from me uh, and my colleagues. Uh, of which I would have had a fair fair hunk of it. Uh, what have I got? Zilch, nothing, Z zero, no money. And it's the only industry in the world you can steal from. I mean, if you could illegally download a, 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 a ticket, an aeroplane ticket to anywhere in the world from any company you like to fly anywhere you wanted to um, for nothing, do you think they'd put a stop to it? Yes, they would. But that's what's happening to my industry and nobody's doing anything about it until recently and we've all got off our bums, and I put out a commercial which I think is very good. We, we've got to make it uncool. It we've is uncool. Un, un, uncool. It's, to not, it's not uncool. It's disgusting, filthy habit. It's mm -hmm. stinking, filthy theft 
from, it's from destroying people. the industry. Yeah. That amount of money, if you think about it, being able to go back into the industry. A, a billion a year in to, Australia alone. Two artists, two filmmakers, two production companies. We, Our industry would turn around. Yeah. When you get the great lighting guy who can light, light like a, a, a Renaissance painter, wiring houses so they can keep the missus and the kids and the mortgage under control, and you lose that person, uh, and uh, th- these are the ones that are getting killed off. Only 0.2% of them are multi-millionaires in the Nicole Kidman area of, of the world. They're, they're knocking people around uh, ordinary Joes every day. They're just making us all bleed. We're not going to give up. We're not gonna, you're not going to beat us, you bastards. We're going to stay here and we're going to win. But you've got to stop doing it.